It's an absolute honor and privilege to have Major Hugo Libba with us. Um, Hugo was a chopper tech um, uh, during the Rhodesian War uh, for the South African Air Force. And um, as you know, many of the uh, South African choppers and pilots and technicians came to our assistance during the Rhodesian War. And, um, and Hugo has some really interesting stories about his time as a chopper tech with pilots um, like Ula Grinica. You may recall uh, Don Price, I think it's around about episode 10 of Fighting Men of Rhodesia. Don Price mentioned uh, the incident with uh, Ula Grinica. Um, and uh, so it's with great anticipation that uh, that I'm I'm sitting talking to, to Hugo. Hugo, without any further ado, brother, um, I'm gonna le let you have the floor. Mm. This was really my first introduction into, you know, into how the, the roadies used to do it, you know, and uh, and it was quite by, by accident that we became involved, you know. We were flying from, uh, did it, you know, what the normal transport sort of uh, trip that we did, taking a brigadier from 17 Squadron up to Messina, you know, close to your guys' border there. And we were there for the week and waiting, you know, and flying this guy around whenever he wanted us. But most of the time, we're just sitting, you know, you know, two youngsters in an aircraft, you know, and we're very bored, you know, and we're flying up and down the river and saying, okay, you know, and we heard about the Rhodesians having ops on the other side. And that stage, you were having a huge ops. I think it was into Mozambique. You did external there. And um, we just heard about this, you know, and as we were you know, sort of fiddling around there and getting bored with ourselves, we decided let's uh, pop across the border and just go and visit you guys, you know, because that bite pitch, you know, is very close by. And um, when we landed there, you know, the guy showed us around. We had some coffee and um, the guy even showed us their field hospital. But little did I know, you know, but he showed us our field hospital. And I even said to him, I said, well, I wouldn't mind lying in this field, you know, it really looks state of the art, you know, it's really nice, I remember me saying that, but anyway, so while we were there, and I'm not sure if it was at the same base, or when we went to another sort of forward base, which was, I don't know if it was one of the um, uh, fire force bases, I'm not sure, I don't remember, but I remember there came a call through their ops room, and this guy called Ula in and he said, listen, we've got now a bit of an issue. We've got a stick out there. They, they, they're really taking some flack. You know, they're being ambushed by quite a huge group. And we don't have any aircraft available. You know, we have one, I think it's a Cessna Sky Shark, you know, the one with a speaker on, you know, to talk to guys on the ground and direct mortar fire and stuff like that. But um, otherwise, apart from that, they could send out a land tail there, you know, a, a, a column by land, you know, in a truck. But they'll take them quite a while to reach it because it was, I, if I can remember correctly, about 40 minutes flying there to where these guys are. And would we consider taking out you know, a couple of mag gunners out there just to assist these guys? We said, well, what a question. I mean, you know, now I've got something to do. You know, this is, of course, we'll do. But then we realized, you know, it is, uh, we're not really there. You know, we should not be there. The aircraft's got all the South African markings on. So we decided, okay, I opened the back doors and I took some of this black is beautiful and masking tape, you know, and covered the, the South African markings on the aircraft. And then the front door of the aloe on my side, um, you know, it just had a sort of a, a quick release on it with locking wire. So I, I pulled a quick release. I took off the front door, you know, to, to give me some access because we had now, I can't remember, it's three, I think it was three guys, three mag gunners we put in the back. And then I was sitting in the in the left hand seat. Now, this aircraft, you know, as as you know, luck or what you can call will have it, it was a dual control aircraft. So it was a standard aircraft, not a gunship, not a car, no armament on. So you had the three seats in the front and the dual controls for the second pilot, you know, for train stuff like. And Luckily, the seats on the aircraft were still the old armor plates we used in the bush. You know, that a small armor plate portion at the bottom of the seat and a small armor at the back, not the seats they used to use later on the kite cars, you know, the gunships and stuff like that. And a part of that, the reason I'm saying that is, I mean, 
that actually saved both me and Ula's lives. The fact we had a chance. These two, you know, old armor seats in the on. But anyway, so I got him to the left seat. And I realized now we're not a gunship, so we had to protect ourselves. So I could uh, R1 or F1 and taped him together with and he says, okay, now we like a steel you know, it's like in, I can, you know, put down some ground fire if required, but you can't just fly like it. So anyway, so off we go. Prior to taking off, um, I saw Ulla Grinneke only on his lap strap, which was not normally the case. Normally the pilots fly with shoulder straps and a lap strap, and the engineers fly with a lap strap only you know, to look for the tail and you can find landings and stuff like that. And that actually saved Ula's life because some of the rounds later on went into the back of his head. He wasn't able to duck the set. Those would surely would have to yeah, So uh, we've taken off now and we're flying to this area. And on the way there, uh, my bono, which we called the flying helmet, packed up communications. I took it off and I put it in front of me and I put my headset back on. And um, as we were approaching the area, the star, the Cessna that was orbiting now above, his gun, um, was speaking to us and he says, okay, we must be careful on the approach we take into this because they are totally surrounded. There's only one small gap. I think it was to the south that we should approach in. So approach through the south. And we didn't see anything, no trace, no movement, nothing. Because obviously the moment they, they heard the aircraft, they must have thought it was a gunship or, or at least a G-car. Because like, you know, you don't want any other allies, unarmed airline in Rhodesia in those days. Anyway, we landed. And while we, um, on, the, on, the, on the ground, the Telstar says they requested that one of the mag gunners in the back with us, we must please take him. Uh, with us when we take off because they've got a captured terrorist um, and I think they said they, they've got one of their guys or they tied him up or something but we must take one mag gunner with us to go and pick up you know this captured ter. so we said okay fine uh, the rest of the guys got out of the aircraft and then we started taking off now as we started taking off the Telstar shouted at us over the radio he says listen guys Go left, go left, go left. You're flying right over the main concentration of these guys. And Ula then went left, and then he shouted, no, go right again. So as we maneuvering, going through transition, obviously we're bleeding off a lot of speed on the aircraft. So we were very, very slow and low. And as he banked the second time, I just saw this sort of green curtain of tracer. Massive amount of tracer coming up to us. And I said to Ula, listen, we're taking serious ground fire. And Ula says, yes, from his side. So um, I decided, okay, I'm going to lay down some, some, some ground fire, you know, just at least to fire and see if we can, we can stop them. And as I fired the, the F1, I felt that nothing was happening. You know, I could feel my fingers moving, but there was no trigger there. So I, I couldn't understand what's happening. I'm looking down at the, at the rifle on my lap, and I saw that my hand wasn't on the rifle. And then I saw there was blood on my shoulder. So, so they already shot me in the arm and my arm was lying next to me on the co seat. And all I was doing, I was touching, I was lying underneath the collective in actual fact where Ula was flying and I was feeling his fingers, but, you know, because he already shot me in the arm and I realized something happened. And I thought, well, okay, I must at least turn the F in around so that I can try and fire with my left hand. And as I turned it around, I lost grip on it and it fell out of the aircraft. So now... We had nothing to protect us. So I decided, okay, well, this is it. There's nothing more we can do. And then I saw a lot of rounds coming through the plexiglass in front, you know, and there's huge sort of gaps and holes in the plexiglass. And then also some rounds coming through the honeycomb floor in front of me. And when I saw that, I pulled my feet from, you know, underneath me because I was scared they're going to, you know, shoot me in the foot now. So I pulled it in. And I, and I laid back. And as I laid back, they shot the headset off my head. Now, they did not hit the headset. They hit the cord of the headset. But anyway, the headset was off, so I had no comms now. 
And I was feeling very sorry now for myself because, you know, I, I realized now I had no comms. I can't even talk to you. And the next moment, they shot me in the in the bum, you know, on the right hand, like high up in my, in my bum cheek. And I felt that round going in. And the problem is, you know, with getting shot, if there's nobody to tell you and you can't see, you're not sure how bad it is, you know. But I felt it going in. And I remember later the guy said, but how did it feel? I said, well, you know, I, you always used to weld in my garage. And I said, you know, it feels like these chipping hammers that you, that you, uh, you know, used to, 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 to take the sag off a weld. It felt like being hit with a little welding hammer, you know, because you could feel the punch and there's no real pain, but you could feel it's, a, you know, it's breaking up inside. But anyway, so I thought, well, now I'm really stuffed. You know? So now I'm sitting and, and I'm thinking now, then what do I do? And in the meantime, the, the, they keep on firing. You know, I, I said later on, it, it sounded like a guy with a hand of gravel throwing it against corrugated iron. You know, it was just continuous gunfire hitting that aircraft, you know. And Ula was swerving left, right, left, right, left, right. And as we're swerving, obviously, we're bleeding down our speed, you know, so we're getting slower. Eventually, I don't know after what period, you know, the the the, the, the gunfire stopped. And I thought, well, okay, at least we're still flying. And um, the gunfire stopped. So we must be, be out of, out of the, 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 you know, their range. But now I was uh, really getting worried because I could feel now, you know, it was getting painful. And I thought, well, okay, let me just lie down slightly on the co-pilot seat on the right of me, you know, just to, to, to you know, get off my bum, which is, you know, was, was hurting now. And as I was lying over, um, I, I realized I could not lie on the collector because the collector was just next to me, the dual collective now. And I was lying on the seat and I thought, okay, let me just see if I can, I can lift up a little bit. And as I lifted up, I saw that the part of the headset cord is wrapped around the fuel shut of cock on the ally. Now, if you pull that and the fuel shut of cock shuts all fuel off to the engine, then we're going to prank. So I immediately lay down. I thought, yes, I must not compound the issue any further because if we are, I managed to, to, to have the aircraft, the engine shut down, then we're in real trouble. But anyway, so I'm lying like this and feeling very sorry for myself, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing how bad they are meat. And in the meantime, Ula is flying this aircraft and there's all this noise in the cockpit because there's not much of the windscreen left, you know. The doors are open. There's a lot of blood on my, on my glasses, you know, so um, I can't see very well. So I'm looking at the instruments to see I see we've got enough fuel, the oil pressure, I see no oil pressure on the aircraft, but that, you know, nothing I could do at that stage, and I looked at that. And then the troop at the back shouted, oh, shit, he's dead. And I thought, what? Who is he talking about? So, I mean, it must have been that Ula asked him, you know, he must check, you know, if I'm okay or something like that, you know, we, you know or ask him, because I didn't hear anything. And I realized now this guy must be talking about me. So, I, you know, my left hand was still okay. So I waved to Ula and trying to, to, to draw his attention. And Ula wasn't looking at me at all. He was looking straight ahead of him and flying. And later on, I said to Ula, why did you not even look at me? I tried to draw your attention. You didn't even turn your head. He said, yes, but, you know, some of the, some of the, the not shrapnel, but, you know, pieces of the plexiglass of the windscreen, um, got into his mouth and he felt these pieces in his mouth and he thought that it was part of his teeth and he's been shot through the cheeks or the neck or something and if he turns his head he might you know break his spine off or something like that that's what I thought but anyway that's why I didn't turn his head and looked at me anyway so now we're flying and we flew back for I guess another 30 minutes but you know now I was, you know, thinking of all the, the possibilities now. If we prank this aircraft, you know, I won't be able to run. So, you know, they're going to pick me up and they don't like chopper crews. The third's going to really have a field day with me. And I'm thinking, geez, this is the worst thing that can happen if we prank this aircraft. But eventually, uh, Ula flew then straight to that base where the field hospital was where we were in the morning. He flew, flew straight there. And I felt the aircraft turning and it started to clear. And I thought, okay, at least now we're somewhere. 
But as Ulla fled, one, some of the rounds went through the talk tube on the rudders. So it had a burr on. And as Ulla tried to push the rudders, it was, it, it, it was, it was stuck or key. And he nearly pranked the aircraft. And I thought, man, if we get, you know, prank the aircraft now, we're so close, you know, then um, that's going to be the worst outcome. Anyway, so we landed. And by that time, I was no really relieved, you know. So okay, if I die, at least I die amongst my own people in a bed or something. That that I can handle. But to die out there in the bush you know, and have the thirst drop, that was you know, something I looked forward to. So I was in very good spirits as we landed. And Ula immediately jumped out of the aircraft and he shouted, stretcher, stretcher. And we used to have this game between the pilots and the engineers, you know, when we fly on the pitch change road. Uh, pitch change uh, levers on the top of the rotor head, which you could not see from inside of the aircraft. Um, they each had a different color. There were three of them, one for each blade. It was a red, a yellow, and I think it was a green or blue. I'm not sure now. And then we each guessed which blade stopped in front because you had to stop the blade in front with a rotor brake so you don't have the blades hanging over the what we call a Strela mod, which is an anti-SAM modification we did to the exhaust on the allo. So that your, it dissipates the heat in case the guys try and fire a SAM at you, you know, heat-seeking uh, missile. So the one blade stopped by chance right in front, and I just shouted, you know, the game we played, did each guy guess, you know, and I said, yellow! And Ulla looked at me, and his eyes were so big, he thought I must have been dead, and now I'm shouting at him. And I shouted, yellow! You know, because the, the rule was the guy who's right with the color he just uh, gets all his drinks for free and the other guy buys all the drinks at night, you know, in the pub. So from there on, uh, they took me out to the, into that field hospital and um, they started operating on me, cut my overall off. And I said to the doc, I said, yes, guy, you know, I only want to know something, please. You know, are the crown jewels still okay? Because <laughs> that was my big worry now. I felt the round going at the bottom. I don't know what it is. But I just wanted to check, you know. He says, no, that's fine. All the crown jewels are still fine. I said, okay, with that I can live. So then they put me under, did an op. Um, I had one round in the back of my bum, one round in my lower leg, the round in my upper arm, which broke the, 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 the arm at the top, and some shrapnel in my back and in my face and stuff like that. But they, the, 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 the biggest problem was obviously the round in my bottom because it went through you know missed my kidneys and ended up you know somewhere in my hip and it broken it's broken up you know the, the round so there's a lot of pieces of shrapnel anyway so they operate me there but they said they couldn't do anything more they had to take me out back to south africa to casino hospital to do another op there um and then they put us in a ambulance me and ula and with one mag under at the back, because those days, you know, in Rhodesia, there was a curfew. You're not allowed to travel on the roads after, I think it was nine at night. I can't remember. So I was thinking, you know, if we get ambushed now in this ambulance, that will be even worse. But luckily we made it. We got back to Bite Beach uh, Hospital. They did a, uh, another op on me there. And the next morning, uh, they flew a Puma from 19 Squadron to come and pick me up. And uh, while we in the ambulance stopped there at the rugby field where the Puma landed, my sergeant major, who was the tech sergeant major, who was in charge of the aircraft maintenance. He flew along, you know, to recover the aircraft and look at it. And um, in the set trip that they sent back to headquarters, the aircraft had in excess of 50 entrails just in the cockpit area. And they said, the tail boom looked like what they call sift right. You know, it's like a sieve because there's more holes in the tail. So that aloe really took a lot of punishment and it took us all the way back, you know. And then when the sergeant major got to the back of the ambulance and opened the doors and he looked in, we called him Cracker Coop. That was our nickname for him. And he said to me, Lebiki, did you see what your aircraft looks like? Look what you've done to my aircraft. I mean, how will we ever repair this aircraft? You know? And I thought, well, okay. But that's fine as long as I'm alive. So there they took me to one more. They operated on me there. I spent about three weeks in intensive care. And then I uh, 
got out of hospital, this was in September, I think November, December. Uh, they discharged me, and then I had to do my flying medical again. And as luck would have it, on the 22nd of December, 21st of December, I got my flying medical back again. And uh, my arm was okay, it was healed, you know, and they did a, you know, everything else was sort of fine. And then um, my aircraft, the 629 Allohead that we flew, that we had the, the, the contact with, also came out of Atlas. They replaced the whole boom. They patched the, 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 the cockpit area. They replaced the motor, the engine, and they replaced the blades and stuff like that. So it came out of Atlas at the same time. And in those days, just on, on in December, we started doing the Polo 2 operations into Rhodesia as part of the African, South African support to, to, to Rhodesia. So I took that same aircraft back to Rhodesia. And the parts are very superstitious. None would like to fly with me. And the only pilot that was prepared to fly was Ulag, uh, HP Mer. You know, so I and we flew back at same aircraft. And then we did a tour in December. I think I did another tour in January and in July. Um, now, the experiences during my time in Rhodesia, you know, it was really, it was really exceptional. Because, you know, the way they operated was much different than we did in, in Angola. You know, the Fire Force concept, you know, they developed to a very fine art, you know, and I couldn't believe the amount of kills that they got, you know, and the way that the way that they operated. But that impressed me very much. And also the hospitality of the people there, you know, um, as South Africans, you know, you couldn't walk into a pub there. The moment you open your mouth, they realize you're South African. They spoiled us so much. And initially, you know, I was very, very apprehensive. You know, the moment I see Tracer coming up to me, you know, on the first tour, oh, you know, you lose a lot of confidence, you know. Of, uh, uh, you know but life had got a bit better. In the second and third tours was a bit better. And then I remembered also um, we used to refuel on the farms. You know, they had a little sort of a area, you know, so which which – with 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 uh, wire sort of roped off or wired off as you can call it, which they had the paraffin drum stash in there the, the, the after, and you could land there and refuel at the farms, and then you know sometimes I remember two days before before New Year I think we landed on this one farm doing a contact there and then this guy comes from the main house you know a, a black guy he was obviously the butler with a white sort of jacket on and a blue sash, you know, and he says, good morning, sir. And he handed us this tray of mince pies and a jug of ice cold orange juice, you know, stuff like that, that the madam of the house sent, sent to us. He said, the madam sends this. So you have juice and mince pies and off you go and fly back to the contact. Now the contrast between, you know, the fact that, you know, you landed this farmhouse and then all of a sudden five minutes later you into this, contact, you know, and I respected the Rhodesians very much, you know, for the, you know, the spirit in handling that situation. I remember we were old years eve, we had an op uh, close to Shabani somewhere, and we could not fly back at night, you know, to fly back at night with allies, especially, you know, formation of allies with, with um, your navigation lights on was looking for trouble. So, uh, and obviously our Keiko commander, his fiancée was in Shabani, so we used that opportunity to night stop in uh, Shabani. And the uh, mayor of Shabani invited us, came out to the, to the, where we landed on, I think it was at the school, rugby field or something. He came out, you know, and they invited us to the, to the old year's eve bash in the, in the city hall. We went like that, you know, with our, you know, camo pants, fallies, no socks as we used to fly, you know, and the Air Force green shirt, short sleeve shirt. And then they treated us like royalty, you know, and you could dance with any girl because, you know, you, and, 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 and nobody worried. The rest of the people were all in, in sort of tuxes and long dresses and stuff like that. But, you know, we were treated like royalty, you know. So that, that to me was much nicer than 
our own war in Angola where nothing like that ever happened. I can maybe just also recall during July, we had this one uh, operation. We got briefed that uh, we were taking off six o'clock the next morning or before six. And we were not taking any black troops, only white troops. And it's not external because I thought first we're going on external, but they wouldn't allow South Africans to fly uh, on externals. And um, we flew to Fort Vic first. And then there we met up with another six G cars and another four K cars. And I can't remember the amount, but I think we were 12, 12 G cars. And if I'm not mistaken, four or six K cars, the gunships with the 20 million. And by now, we were not still not, you know, sort of being briefed exactly what was happening. And at the last stop, where the rest of the, 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 the we picked up the rest of the, the K cars and the G cars, um, they said to us that what's happening, they've uh, received notification from combined headquarters that um, the auxiliaries um, from Sutole and Abel Musarewa's auxiliaries that were fighting with us at that time had plans to, you know, uh, invade towns like Shabani and some of the other towns. I don't, can't remember if it was Fort Vic as well. And they were causing lots of problems with the locals and stuff like that. And they're going to ask them to surrender. And the plan was now that the Cessna Sky Shout fly ahead. There will be a land tail on the ground. They notified the auxiliaries that they're going to replace all the AK-47s and RPG-7s and stuff with more more uh, modern weapons. They're going to give them G3s, you know, instead of the AK-47s, and they're going to give them new mortars and stuff like that. And that was the ruse that they used to get them to go airfield. So the plan was they're going to, he's, there's going to be a guy on the ground in a land talent after the major, um, and he had two stopper groups with him on the ends of the, the airfield, and then he had his driver with him, in the in the in the uh, main gary and then he would address these guys and say listen guys uh, they're all there you know standing in a sort of a, a formation there um, the sky shout will then fly over and notify them that they should lay down their arms and if they don't lay down their arms there's a fire force five minutes out and we're going to take them and unfortunately, we were now flying very low level, you know, real nap of the earth flying so that they could not hear us coming in. And at that moment, the sky shout said, well, he's got problems with his comms. He cannot, the speaker's not working on the aircraft, so he cannot notify the guys on the ground. And these guys are getting very jittery. And the major on the ground saying, listen, guys, what's happening? Because these guys are looking at the sky shout. They fully armed all these guys. There were about 300 of them. And uh, what is happening now? And they said, well, he must now physically stand up in that uh, sort of gary of his and then tell these guys he must lay down their arms. So he said, okay, but he's going to wait until we're about five minutes out and then he's going to tell them. And then he told them. And the moment he told them, they realized this was a trap and they started firing on him. No, they killed his driver, but he ducked inside the gary and closed the hatch. But at that stage, we were pitching. The first gunships were pitching. So the gunship pitched and started firing into these guys. And the rest of the troopers we were carrying, carrying I think it was ROI troops, um, around the, the perimeter of the airfield and dropped the, the stopper teams as, you know, all around the, 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 the airfield. And then try and take on all the guys running out the bomb shelling out of the airfield. The, the, you know, the, we killed them with the G cars and the K cars killed the bulk on the airfield. And that was really a, I mean, it was really a turkey shoot, but I mean, they fired back, but I mean, they had no chance against five gunships and such a close concentration. And I remember afterwards, um, we counted 483 bodies there, plus the ones that we collected from outlying areas, you know, uh, where we took them out also, you know, so that was the, that was one uh, operation I can remember, but like I say, that wasn't the, the nicest thing to do. That's what we were ordered to do, and that we did. And I think, John, if there's anything you want to ask me, but I um, mean, that's basically my observations. A, a couple of guys have asked me, including uh, um, 
Loris Basson has asked me to ask you uh, what what it was like sort of fighting in someone else's war. How, how did you feel about fighting in Rhodesia? Um, uh, uh, Tony Ballinger also asked the same question um, to tell us about your other ops, which you have done, but, you know, what did it feel like to be fighting in a war that was not really your your fight, so to speak? Or did you see it as part of the South African fight, ultimately? I mean, we were on the border of South Africa, so... Now, John, I can only talk about, you know, uh, my own feeling about that, you know. I And most of the guys felt the same, you know. First of all, I mean, you were like a bastion, you know, between us and the rest of Africa, which was all at that stage, you know, trying to to, to overthrow, you know, uh, the white governments in Rhodesia as well as in South Africa. So I felt, I mean, you guys were basically taking the brunt of the of of of, of uh, the war, and you know, if we had any chance, obviously we had to help. I mean, and you. I had no issue whatsoever fighting in another guys. I mean, we felt we were the same people, you know, just different countries. But, I mean, we had the same objective. You know, we were against communist rule. And, um, you know, there was no issue at all from my side. And I couldn't remember any of the other air crew ever complaining and saying what we do here, you know, because we – and it was such, you know, it's now – you know, I can't say it was a nice war, but I mean, we were treated so well by the Rhodesians, you know, and we received like a small uh, sort of a allowance, which you could never even spend in Rhodesia, because I mean, all the guys bought all the drinks, you never managed, you open your wallet, the guy says, put back your wallet in your pocket, and we never had to buy a drink in, in Rhodesia, in all the pubs, the guys just kept on, you know, they're treating us, and they invited us to parties, and they invited us to, you know, to have dinner with them, and you know, they were so nice to us. I mean, it was, I mean, you have anything like that in Angola. I mean, it just, you know, but so, so none of us ever had an issue, you know, and um, I think the way the fire force worked, we were very impressed the way they, the forces worked and we like to get that experience as well, which you could use in our own, own uh, area of warfare. So there was no issue whatsoever from myself or any of the other crew that ever thought, you know, this was a, you know, an issue fighting in Rhodesia. Do you have any stories of your time in Angola? Um, I believe, for example, I was quite interested to hear that Ulla Grinica went on to uh, be awarded the Honoris Crux. Um, and I just wondered if you ever flew with him again or, you know, if you can tell us any of those stories. Um, John, I was... I'm saying unfortunate and not fortunate because I missed a lot of the ops. You know, if you were in the bush and they, they had a big, I, I missed out on Savannah. I missed out on the Moscow one. I missed out on the reindeer one. And every time I was just not in the bush or part of the crew that looked up, you know, so my bush experience was very much in between all the big operations. I never did any of the big operations, which is, you know, eventually, like I said to the guys, the day when I left the Air Force, I gave back to them 183 days of leave that I never took. And the reason I never took it, because I was so, I didn't want to miss the ops. But eventually, you do miss these ops, you know. So so um, my experiences in, in uh, Angola was very, you know, small contacts and stuff like that. I can remember as a novice, Chopper Teco engineer, my first tour in uh, Angola. <laughs> I had a pilot which was, uh, we called him Split Pin McCall. He was a thin guy, a very nice guy. And me and him, I've been in the bush now for a week and he gets there a week after me. And, and we tasked to, to go and pick up a wounded guy, uh, a Kazavak. So I had a doctor with us, and we put the stretcher in at the back, and the doc is sitting in the middle seat with us, and now he's flying there. Now, you know, now uh, uh, Neil says to me, 
okay, you know, you must help me now. I say, yes, because I'm not the experienced guy. I've been there a week. And Neil's been there one day, you know. And we're youngsters and we are so inexperienced and stupid. So we fly out with this dock. We get to the cut line. Now we heard about this cut line. But we've not, one of us has ever seen the cut line. And the cut line is really nothing. It's just a, it's just some places overgrown. Some places is just where the grass and the trees are cut a bit. But there's nothing really there. So we fly and we fly across the cut line without knowing it into Angola. And this Kazabak we were supposed to pick up just south of the cut line. But now we're flying and we got lost a bit. So now we're only flying a time and distance. And eventually, uh, Neil says to me, yes, you know, what? what, what is, do you see anything? I said, no, but, but, but maybe I see something here. And I saw something which looked like a trench or like a small hut or trench. I said, just circle here. And now we're talking to the guys on the ground. They're saying, but they can't even hear us. So we don't know where we are. I said, but just circle here. And as we're circling, now I'm sitting with a 303 machine gun in the door, I'm looking now outside and see if I can see anything. And just the previous day, I changed some of the tail rotor blade tapes. Now, the tail rotor blade tapes was, was something that, you know, protected the leading edge of your tail rotors in the bush, you know, with the sand erosion and stuff like that. And sometimes it doesn't don't do a good job. These tail rotor blades, uh, the, the, the tape come off. But anyway... So we're circling now, and the next moment I hear, and Neil says, what's that? I said, yes, I don't know. Maybe it's those blade tapes that are coming off. Now I'm leaning further out of the chop. I'm looking at the back for the tail rotor, and I'm looking now to see where are these tapes coming off. And I hear, and I thought, what? Why does it stop again? And I'm looking further again. <laughs> what is happening? I said, I can't see, but it must be these blade tapes coming off me. We fly over to camp and these guys are firing at us. I mean, it's so low. You can actually hear the breach in the AK-47 go. But we're thinking it's about, no, we both look. And the dog eventually said, guys, but isn't that right? <laughs> and then we realized We've been raped, and then we get the hell out of it. So we got totally lost. We never managed to pick up the Kazabak. We land, we land, I think, at the Congo. I can't remember which base we landed. And we got out of the aircraft, and we looked at the aircraft all the, and we had one going through the radio at the top of the roof of the aircraft, and two through the blades. But we only saw it when we landed. But now we're so embarrassed. We don't want to tell anyone, but we're scared. The doc's going to tell the people, so we must report this because the aircraft's got no battle damage. Now we try and, you know, and, 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 and sugarcoat this as much as possible, this contact that we were in. But we didn't even know we were in the contact, you know. I didn't fire even one day out, you know. So that was my first bush tour, you know, totally ignorant, the youngster, and you don't know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Hugo, thank you so much, brother. Uh, I really appreciate um, uh, hearing your side of the story. Uh, it, 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 as you say, there's some corrections to the story that Don Price told. Uh, so it's nice to have to have uh, your story on the record as well. Much appreciated, my brother. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, John. I enjoyed it as well. Astonishing when you when you think of modern day armies, only um, your highly specialized, highly trained units deploy in groups of small groups of four and eight. But um, for the Rhodesian National Servicemen, um, this was the way it happened. Uh, these chaps were out of school; they were put through a, um, a pretty rigorous uh, infantry training course, uh, admittedly, but um, at the end of that, they were out uh, with a map and a compass, a lot of them, and um, they were in the real world of a shooting war. And um, these are the youngsters that ended up under your command 
Um, and you were obviously the right guy for the job because you came with so much combat experience and uh, you could lead these guys in the right direction. But um, still, it's a, I think it's a testament to the caliber of the young Rhodesians that they were able to rise to the occasion as well as they did. Um, one in the company was posted with me and as I see from uh, Big Falls in the north of the country, right down to the south of the country to White Ridge. And uh, it was an extremely hot area, uh, terrorist wise, um, of both Zipra and Zanla coming into the country and focusing the uh, ambushes and so on on the two roads, the one going up to Fort Vic and then to Salisbury and the other one going up to Bulawayo. And in that B, in that triangle that uh, was between the two roads, we had a tremendous concentration of guerrillas uh, giving us lots and lots of hassle. They're ambushing the convoys daily. And anyway, he, he came to me and he said, sir, the, the guys are ready for you. And I went out there and I read them and I said, look, all you guys have been doing is turning bloody government rations into crap right now. You haven't just achieved anything. You haven't killed anybody. You've had some fleeting contacts, but no connections. So go out there and for God's sake, do something about it. So he went out there and a couple of hours later, uh, I was called to the ops room and they were having a contact. And our boss had picked up tracks with these guys. It was a little six man patrol. And they had followed these guys and they were, it was quite a considerable group. There were 60 of them. And our boss and taking my rev to heart had got his guys in extended line and ordered a charge and they charged the 60. <laughs> and it's originally, initially backed off and Bolson was engaging in them and they realized that there weren't a lot of guys there. They started really giving them uh, a squirt back, you know. And that's when we got airborne, we got over the position. And what we didn't know is the 60 went back to another group, a bigger group, and in, in fact joined up forces and there were like 200 of them against six guys. And we were overhead, uh, the target area in the 206, Jackson was firing the MAG out the door. We were getting like this hail of fire coming up from the ground upwards and green tracers flying at us, hitting the aircraft and so on. Jackson got hit and suddenly I had this little white face back of me saying, I'm hit, I'm hit. And I said, well, where? And he kept feeling around on his backside or whatever, but there was no hit, he wasn't hit, you know. He was, it felt a punch in the backside from the rounds hitting the sandbags, but he fortunately wasn't wounded or anything. So we carried on revving the, the contact uh, on the ground with Bolson and then uh, heavily engaged and I was bringing in a call sign from the north I was was running down to give them assistance when I suddenly heard uh, a really, very familiar voice on the on the air and it was a chopper pilot who worked with us in the earlier months with fire force and so on it was Ulo Grinica from the South African Air Force and he had been sitting on the airstrip across the border at Messina and board stuff playing with his radio, listening to stuff, gone to 118.7, and heard this punch-up going on, and he said to his tech, well, I don't know what you think, but uh, I'm going across here to help my guys. They're in a hell of a position. They're in a hell of a job there. So he came across, the net and he went back to one in the company, got hold of the CSM, got the CSM to deploy troops up the road, uh, a land tail with extra troops, and he was then ferrying in the troops to me, all off his own bat, off his own accord. And I didn't know anything about it. And I first heard his voice and he said, uh, Hello, Sam Ray, this is Ulo. How can I help you? Where can I put the first stop? So basically, Alan's in the South African Air Force. He's got no right, he's got no authority to cross the border and come into Indonesia. So without any no. permission at all, he just gets into his helicopter and flicks up to find you and help you. Correct. Anyway, <clears throat> he had ferried in a couple of stops for us uh, to assist and help Alan Bolson. He had picked up one of my guys on the indication of local Peter Barris, who was going back to show them where they had a captured and they tied him to a tree so they could carry on in the punch up. Uh, they picked up, the, uh, well, they were going to pick up the captured when uh, we, the big group of on the ground, joined forces and now we were being engaged by 200 on the ground. Uh, and it was like hail coming up. and, and the aircraft I was in was hit like 130 times. Um, this is a 206. Never, the 206, yeah. <laughs> never heard old uh, Ulla again, again, but I couldn't get sort of involved because we were too sort of involved in what we were doing. And, and uh, old uh, Ollie Knight was doing a fighter pilot stuff, ducking and diving where he could. Um, and he said to me, look, um, I think we need to get as high as we can because I've got no oil pressure. 
uh, and because we're going to lose this now, we're going to lose the engine. I said, oh my goodness. So we climbed up high, spiraled around and went up high and then suddenly the engine cut and we had no power and it was very quiet, very silent. And I said, cheers to the guys on the ground. And we started heading back. It was sort of last light and we managed to do a dead, dead prop landing on the Bightridge airfield having alerted them and they had vehicles out with their lights shining up on the runway because we had no lights on the runway and we did a dead prop landing on the runway we just hit it right at the very end um, so we were very lucky and when i got out the aircraft legs were shaking and so on and this tf captain came up to me the two uh, were based on the airport at the airfield uh, colonel french was in charge of them we were doing an hdf there or about to start a big hdf where they were going to be under command me and he said uh, major you're in big trouble you ordered a guy from South Africa across here. And you know, you don't know, but he was shot down and he managed to auto rotate at the end of the other uh, end of the runway. And his technician was shot five times and your guy, the Barros was shot twice. And uh, there's big cuck in the land. You're going to be court-martialed as long with Ulla Grinica and the Colonel wants to see you ASAP. So I went there and I was really, really cross. And I gave old Cedric French a rev uh, because I knew him from Civvy Street and he was in part of the Farmers Co-op, whatever. And I said, instead of crapping on us, we've just been to a hell of a big punch up here. And if we, if it wasn't for Ulla Grinica, we'd have definitely lost guys on the ground. So instead of doing, uh, you know, reporting back that you're going to have us court martial or whatever, I said, we should be doing the opposite of that. And uh, we then, he saw the light and, and we changed our plan and we put in letters. And I'm happy to report that uh, Air Marshal uh, Rogers, who's in charge of the South African Air Force, um, accepted the whole thing in the spirit in which Ulla Grinica meant it to be. And Ulla Grinica got a honest crooks for his actions. But the aircraft had to be ferried across the, the, the bike bridge, uh, bridge at night, covered with camo nets and so on, because it was totally stuffed. He had taken like 65 hits and uh, nobody even knew that Chopper was in with us. So that was the kind of thing that we would do. Well, there was, um, it's interesting, Bob, that was Bob Rogers, it was General Bob Rogers who was the commander of the South African Air Force said, and he was a great, uh, he had a very soft spot for Rhodesia because his brother, Buck Rogers, was the, um, was the self-appointed mayor of Enkeldorn. Um, he, he owned the service station uh, and he used to run in most of his business from the, the pub at the Enkeldorn Hotel. That was Bob's yeah, right. brother Buck, but they were both Spitfire pilots during the Second World War. And what's quite funny about old Buck is um, after Ian Smith declared UDI, old, old Buck said to hell with it, well, if they're going to declare independence from Britain, I think Enkeldorn should become independent from Rhodesia. We want to be I remember own. that, yeah. And so he declared the Republic of Enkeldorn and started issuing passports. So if you actually wanted to go and have a beer in the Enkeldorn pub, the citizen yeah. of, of the Republic of Enkeldorn. Otherwise, they actually had a jail cell there. And they That's threw right. you inside for being um, an illegal immigrant. But that yeah. was that was on Bob Rowe. Brother Buck. And so I'm sure when he heard the story, all credit to him, he could he could um, he found a way through it and, and did the honorable yeah. thing. Thank heavens. Yeah, that was very good. Uh, I want to just say that Ulla Grinica went on in Angola to get a second uh, on a script. Really? Uh, we were shot, badly shot in the leg. Amazing guy. <laughs>